Okay, welcome back everyone who's made their way back in. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch and connecting with others. I'm happy to be here with my colleague and actually a mentor, Dr. Marcus Noel, to really kick off our last session of the day. Um, here, we're looking at a little bit earlier stages of cancer and um, perioperative managements in gastrointestinal cancers. As our systemic therapies, surgeries, radiation techniques, and even radiation oncology strategies improve, it becomes increasingly important to have a multidisciplinary approach to managing our cancer patients. Um, in this session today, we'll focus on two major treatment areas where the field is really evolving. Um, treatments um, approaches remain controversial and where we as medical oncologists rely heavily on the expertise of our radiation oncologists and surgeon and even radiology colleagues. One area we'll focus on is locally advanced rectal cancer. A curative intent approach in these patients is often balanced, um, trying to balance good oncologic outcomes with some of the toxicities and um, side effects that can really impact the patient's quality of life. And uh, the sequencing of perioperative therapies, organ sparing strategies, and colostomy sparing strategies are really of increasing interest in the research space for clinicians and patients alike. And the second area we'll focus on is the management of pancreatic cancers. The goals of curative therapy are to try to maximize the chance of a margin negative resection and minimize local regional recurrences and metastatic relapse. Um, however, the sequencing of perioperative therapies um, the, the best treatment strategies and uh, the patients, identifying patients who are likely to benefit from some of these therapies like chemotherapy and radiation are still an area of ongoing um, research. So with that, I'll pass it to Dr. Marcus Noel to introduce our first speaker. Um, and... Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our goal is to make sure that we keep everyone awake post-lunch for those in person. Hopefully you'll find this session um, quite interactive and enjoyable. Um, so I have the honor of introducing a uh, former colleague and great friend, uh, Dr. Fergal Fleming. I'm gonna pull up his bio here. So uh, Dr. Fleming is a colorectal surgeon and associate professor of surgery and oncology at the University of Rochester Medical Center. He has an academic interest in optimizing colorectal cancer care delivery and outcomes. He is co-lead of the Rectal Cancer Program at the University of Rochester, which is a national accreditation program for rectal cancer. Uh, the it's, NAPRAC is the abbreviation. Uh, so the University of Rochester is a, uh, a credentialed site. It uh, definitely takes a lot of work and effort to reach that milestone. Um, so Dr. Fleming has led that effort. He is clinical director for Surgical Health Outcomes and Research Enterprise, SHORE a surgically focused health outcomes group at the University of Rochester. He's also a member of the executive board for NAPRAC. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Fleming, uh, Dr. Fleming please uh, take over. Dr. Noel, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, I had a privilege of working with Dr. Noel for over five years and he was uh, integrally involved in an awful lot of some of the data I'm gonna present later in my talk. Um, Okay. Um, so I have no real relevant disclosures, um, apart from that, just so everyone's aware, I am a colorectal surgeon. I'm going to be discussing, in many cases, a lot about medical and radiation oncology, but that's, I think, one of the strengths of the of rectal cancer delivery in the United States is that it is very much a collaboration between various specialties. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the contemporary management of local rectal cancer where we were, where we are, where we're going. Um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit about watch and wait and how you might develop a watch and wait program. I put avoid in parentheses because I think that one of the things that's really important as we make progress, which we have done in total new adjuvant therapy and potential organ preservation, it's also important not to use language that makes patients feel that surgery is a failure. Um, because some patients, unfortunately, still will require um, traditional TME surgery. So for many in the audience, this might be familiar, but if essentially it's hard to believe that 30, 40 years ago, rectal cancer was often treated the same as colon, uh, straight to surgery. Uh, the surgery approach is typically a blunt 
totem is rectal excision. There wasn't an appreciation of the surgical planes. And patients were receiving in an uh, ad hoc fashion, possibly chemo radiation after surgery in the adjuvant setting. Um, number of seminal studies, both in Europe and North America, established clearly the benefit for patients with locally advanced cancer of receiving chemo radiation in the adjuvant setting um, in terms of reducing local regional recurrence. It, around the same period, it became increasingly understood that surgical approach is critical. Uh, total mesorectal excision, meaning a dissection in the correct embryological plane, um, helps to significantly reduce local regional recurrence. Then we came into the 1990s. And the Dutch rectal cancer studies showed that even with good quality surgery, that preoperative short course radiation treatment appeared uh, reduced local regional recurrence. And then, of course, we have the seminal German rectal cancer study showing that delivery of chemo radiation in preoperatively or in the neoadjuvant setting was superior to delivering chemo radiation in the, in the adjuvant setting. So, and then we came on to almost like the logical conclusion from that. So we've gone from shifting our chemo radiation postoperatively to preoperatively, and now we're going full circle. We're talking about delivering all of our systemic therapy and radiation in the front, up front, in the form of total neoadjuvant therapy. I'm going to talk about some of the studies. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the surgical aspects of these studies. So this is kind of where we are now, probably in most um, centers in the United States, a patient presents with locally advanced rectal cancer. You might consider that to be a T stage, T3 and zero, any T stage with an N positive. They basically would often would receive long course chemo radiation, 45 to 50.4 gray, with either um, sensitizing chemotherapy or possibly met in oxalic platinum. And then they would receive up to six months of adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy. And that has delivered very good outcomes in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and that's been based on a series of of well-established, strong, randomized controlled trials showing us that neoadjuvant treatment is the standard of care. And what has long course chemo radiation delivered for us? Certainly reduced toxicity compared to giving chemo radiation in the adjuvant setting, decreased local recurrence. You're not irradiating an anastomosis, which is a surgeon is something that's obviously very, very uh, key issue for me. It's been associated with increased rates of sinker preservation. However, there, come, there are challenges. We all recognize there's variable rates of adjuvant chemotherapy receipt. 40 to 50% of patients do not receive in a timely fashion all their uh, planned chemo radiation. Distant metastasis remains a big issue for us. Up to 40% of patients with stage three will develop metastatic disease. And then the other big one, as survivorship has improved, then obviously patients are living longer. And then the functional outcomes, the treatment toxicity from trimodal therapy, chemotherapy, radiation, and TV surgery becomes more of an issue in their lives. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about functional outcomes because I think that's a key underpinning to why, for many patients, organ preservation is becoming an increasing thing they're asking about. So this is some data from my partner, Larissa Temple, who's very kind enough to share this with me. Dr. Temple basically, uh, when she was working with Morris on Kettering, did this prospective study using a validated bowel function index. And this is about just over 200 patients who received sphincter sparing surgery, their ostomy has been closed. And what you have is this really nice uh, uniform distribution. So basically you can see in the 10 centile, patients with the poorest bowel function, all report soilage, nearly all report impact on their quality of life from their bowel function, and nearly all have to wear a protective undergarment. If you then look at what might be deemed to be um, patients having a good score, still nearly one in six report soilage, and nearly one in five wear a protective undergarment. So that means that the vast majority of patients basically are experiencing symptoms on either a daily or weekly basis, which are impacting on their quality of life. 
And this is basically data showing a very nice correlation between body fat, your bowel function index and quality of life. So that for patients who have um, poor, poor BFI scores, it's very strongly correlated with the global quality of life. One interesting thing to look at is where basically is what would, this is aligned for the, uh, for the quality of life index for patients with a permanent stoma. So this kind of just brings up the kind of nuanced questions that we as surgeons sometimes have to discuss with patients regarding giving them a detailed sense of what their quality of life might look like and their bowel function, getting a coloanal anastomosis versus a permanent colostomy. And, and, and this sort of patient-reported data is crucial to uh, providing informed discussions with patients about these issues. This is just some more data from other centers in Europe where they basically um, they basically found that a significant portion of patients are experiencing on an almost weekly basis issues around their bowel function. And when you collapse those symptoms into um, major and minor, you also see a strong correlation quality of life. So suboptimal bowel function is prevalent. It's uh, a big issue for patients. And it's something which we have to be aware of. And we have to think about what things we can do to help with this treatment related toxicity. So basically, neoadjuvant therapy certainly addressed a lot of the issues that we had 25 years ago. It's helped us reduce the risk of local regional recurrence. It has helped us improve our sphincter preservation rate. But what's also interesting is, the question is, can it be used to achieve organ preservation? We, we started off recognizing that a certain percentage of patients who got chemo radiation would end up with a pathological complete response or PCR. That has led to groups such as Angelina Harpagama postulating, well, if there's no visible tumor after treatment in a, in a coordinated fashion, perhaps you don't need to put them through surgery given the high chance that there'll be no residual tumor. And that's led to increasing interest in the issue of organ preservation because reality is if you don't remove the rectum, patients, you don't put a patient through a fairly large operation and you're also not going to have the added functional impact of a TME and surgery in terms of your bowel function. So this led to the concept of, well, perhaps we would address two issues that are, are big, the big issues in contemporary rectal cancer management. Can we address the issue of distal metastasis? And can we basically potentially increase our rates of organ preservation by shifting that adjuvant therapy, which as we acknowledge, is often not well tolerated in the adjuvant setting and delivering it all up front. So putting all the chips in at the beginning of patient's treatment and what might that look like? So I'm gonna run through a couple of the studies. Um, you know, there's a large number of studies out there. So I've been somewhat selective in the interest of time. And I just wanna run through some of these and discuss how these might influence our practice as we go forward. So for many of the, we might be familiar with the Prodigy study, uh, two, three, multi-centered randomized uh, phase three trial. Um, they stratify by stage, uh, treatment center, tumor location. And basically, locally advanced tumors, and basically they were randomized to the experimental arm. Patient received uh, fulferinox for six cycles over three months, uh, followed by adjuvant chemo radiation, long course, 50.4 gray, and capsidabine. And then they had TME done about seven weeks after completion of CRT. So it wasn't at the time envisaged to offer a watchful waiting in this study. And whereas the control arm, you know, had long course chemo radiation, TME, followed by uh, ide ideally six months of adjuvant chemotherapy. Primary endpoint was three-year disease-free survival. The secondary endpoints, pathological complete response, metastasis-free survival, overall survival, safety, and quality of life. Another study people are probably familiar with is Rapido. So Rapido is a, a, um, an interesting study because it offered a slightly different experimental arm in some respects because they were looking at the use of short course radiation. So this is going to be five cycles by five gray, so 25 gray, um, compared to the more traditional long course, which most people would be familiar with in the United States. 
These, these patients were probably slightly more advanced tumors, 920 patients randomized. So the experimental arm received short course radiation and then either six cycles of KPOX or nine cycles of FALFOX followed by a TME. Whereas then their traditional arm was capsidabine based long course chemo radiation followed by TME and then optional of five, eight cycles of KPOX or 12 cycles of FALFOX. And that was kind of aligned with the fact that many European countries do not um, put a strong an emphasis or recommendation on, on adjuvant chemotherapy, as perhaps we would in North America. Primary study endpoints, disease-related treatment failure, that was kind of an amalgamatum of local regional recurrence, progression, disease progression, et cetera. And then their secondary endpoints, overall survival, or zero resection, PCR, toxicity, surgical complications. And what's interesting is if you kind of look at these two studies side by side, what's very nice about these studies is that the control arm, you know, you can more, maybe a medical oncologist on the call can certainly more nuanced discuss this, but you could make an argument that their standard uh, care arms is kind of what we do in contemporary practice or many places in the United States already. Patients getting stopped long course chemo radiation and then getting adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Um, so it's it, these studies definitely give us two reasonable control arms where it's not like the patients are getting no treatment. So it, it is, it is, I think these studies are very pivotal in terms of any discussions about the direction we're going. So what I've done here is I've just, as, as much as possible, I've tried to line up comparisons. So basically, Prodigy is on the left, Rapido is on the right, your experimental arm obviously is the one with the modified fall, uh, is with modified fulfirinox, and the repeat is a short course in chemotherapy. So primary endpoint was slightly different. It was three-year disease-free survival progeny. And what you can see is that basically the experimental arm basically showed us um, statistically significant uh, improvement in disease-free survival. Whereas if you flip it the other way, for repeatal, treatment failure was lower in the experimental group. So basically, the experimental arms in both studies showed um, an improvement in their primary endpoint, which was a reduction in an improvement in disease-free survival. What's also extremely interesting is the PCO rate, about 28% in the experimental arms in both studies, that compared to 12 or 14%, which is kind of what you would expect for traditional long-force chemo radiation. Local regional occurrence, there was no significant difference. It is notable that the experimental arm did have a slightly higher rate of local regional occurrence in Rapido. Overall survival, no differences. Compliance is always a question here. So the studies measured it in slightly different ways. Roger D looked at multiple ways, looking at basically um, both number of doses received, total dose, dose intensity, and basically, in pretty much all those parameters, the experimental arm did better, uh, received more chemotherapy, and received more cycles due to dose reduction and treatment interruption, the adjuvant setting for the control arm. Rapido, similar enough, they looked at patients received, I think it's more than 75% of the prescribed dose, much, much more likely to be received in the adjuvant setting, which all is, is very much in fitting with what our experience is in the, in the practice. Serious adverse events were not significant um, or outlined as above. So I'm a surgeon, so naturally I had a look at surgical complications. Interestingly, there was a slightly higher rate of surgical complications in the control arm of Prodigy, not the experimental arm. Other interesting point um, is that there was no difference in the permanent ostomy rate. So interesting to me that the treatment escalation did not seem to um, provide or be associated with a higher rate of sphincter preservation. But overall, basically, these studies are suggest should suggest that this offers higher rate of pathological complete response. The local regional occurrence rate appears to be similar. This is probably due to a function of the fact that more chemotherapy is being uh, managed to be delivered in the new adjuvant setting. Um, obviously, it'll be interesting to see with longer follow up whether these. Uh, you start seeing improvement in survival and no difference in permanent ostomy rate. So 
Oprah is a slightly different study. And what's the interesting thing about Oprah is, is that this is a study which instead of mandating trial protocol, the patients will go to surgery. There was an option, basically, if patient appeared to meet uh, criteria for complete clinical response, then they could be offered watch and wait. And to meet that, that would basically be um, res resolution of a mass and direct examination, um, endoscopy evidence of telangiectasia, with no break in the mucosa, and the MRI basically consistent with res uh, treatment response and no residual disease. So Oprah basically randomized um, patients to either a induction or consolidation arm. The induction arm is Falfox and Kpox. And what you'll see here is that basically both, both arms are receiving about four months of systemic chemotherapy, whereas the consolidation arm starts with the chemo radiation followed by the Falfox and Kpox. Then patients are restaged. If they were a non-responder, they were offered t &E. If they were a clinical responder or partial responder, which is a somewhat nebulous term, they were, they were offered watch and wait or WW. What's interesting is when you follow this through is that now this is flipped, I apologize for that, but basically you have the consolidation arm um, on the left of the screen and the induction on the, screen, on the right. And basically very high rates of patients being offered watch and wait between 70 and 76%. But what was very interesting was the fact that in the follow-up, you had a regrowth rate of about 40% seen in the patients who had been assigned to the induction arm. So at three years, your TME, uh, basically your non-TME rate was higher in the patients who went through uh, consolidation followed by consolidation chemotherapy compared to induction. Interesting findings. The primary endpoint to this study was to look for superior disease-free survival compared to historic controls, which they did not see. So I'm going to switch gear a little bit and talk about, well, if, if the emphasis is on trying to avoid total mesorectal excision, are there other surgical options? And yes, there are in certain very, shall we say, uh, defined settings. There are a number of studies that have looked at either some form of local excision um, at, for rectal, early rectal cancer. And I'm going to focus just on the GRECR2 study. The GRECR2 study basically is uh, um, what they did was they basically took um, lower rectal cancer, T2, T3, um, less than or equal to four centimeters in size, mid low rectal. Patients received long course chemo radiation with oxaliplatin, capsidabine. Per protocol, if they had a good response, which was defined as a tumor shrinkage to less than two centimeters, then they were either randomized to a TME or local excision. If on local excision, the patient had a, you know, a, shall we say, not a great response to treatment and it still had a persistent pathological T2 or T3 tumor, then they were recommended to have a complete mesorectal excision. If the patients had a poor response to treatment, meaning there was still a residual scar greater than two centimeters, then they were again recommended to have a TME. This study was based on the, uh, the hypothesis that the local excision group would have a lower rate of, of overall complications, which was a composite of death, tumor recurrence, morbidity. They didn't actually see that. And one of the reasons probably was the relatively high rate of number of patients who went from the local excision um, into the TME um, subarm. So that meant that they had all the morbidity with the TME procedure. Nevertheless, um, followed out data for five years and um, found that in the local excision group, local recurrence was 7% compared to the TME, not statistically significantly different. And basically, um, in terms of disease-free survival and overall survival, similar outcomes. So perhaps in a certain situation where you've had a good response to chemo radiation, but not meeting complete response, this suggests that in these sort of patients with a good but not complete response, perhaps there might be a role for local excision. I would counsel as a surgeon, though, that challenges about this approach are um, often have a lot of issues with pain and wound healing after um, surgical 
uh, local excision and irradiated field. And also the concern is that if you can't, if you do come back with a T2 or T3 tumor, you know, have I, by doing the local excision, compromised my ability to do a definitive operation for the patient? Um, but as I said, an interesting area and potentially offers some uh, area expertise yeah, for some of our patients. So what about early rectal cancer? Well, the reality is for most patients with T1 or T2 disease, they probably won't necessarily traditionally be meeting a medical radiation oncologist that will come through for staging. And then normally we would recommend uh, doing a TME. As we talked about at the start of the presentation, though, TME is not without morbidity. And here is just a, a visualization of 1,000 patients who had T1 and T2 cancer. So the red, the red people represent people who die related to treatment, and then blue is local recurrence. And look at all the poor function, daily symptoms. And that's even more of an issue in our older patients. So the question is, you know, is a TME um, always the appropriate option for some of our patients. And maybe there are certain patients who would do better with different options. Well, one option or one uh, study that's kind of interesting, just to put it out there to make people aware, is a TREC study is done in the United Kingdom. So this was early rectal cancer, T1, T2, N0 on imaging. And the concept to explore was, is it feasible to achieve organ preservation and non-TME surgery? So the concept was the patient got short course radiation followed by a delay, meaning they didn't have they didn't have, they didn't have surgery for about eight to ten weeks. The surgery was a local excision in the form of a TENS, which is a, a form. Um, it's just a platform which we do local excision with a microscope. It works really well. I love doing it. Um, and basically, if the patient had high risk parameters after the TENS procedure positive margin, maximum diameter, lymphovascular invasion, then they were recommended conversion to TME. Now, they ran a parallel arm where either patients may decline to go through TME or if a patient was not fit, felt to be fit enough for a TME, they were kind of observed and followed up. And basically what they just found was that, um, you know, basically didn't find any significant difference in terms of as uh, cancer outcomes between uh, the two groups. What's very interesting is this, is that, look, you've got a fairly high rate of organ preservation. It's 70% in the randomized group, and it's over 90% in the non-randomized group, mainly due to patients declining to have surgery. So again, just something to think about that perhaps in some patients with clinically staged early rectal cancer, with poor functional out, with poor functional baseline, and or patient feeling much more concerned about bowel function and quality of life than necessarily pursuing the optimal oncological outcome, these, this study just enters some interesting um, data to consider. So this is kind of where we are right now. So no response after your treatment, then the patient needs definitive surgery. Near complete response, should you offer a local excision? It's certainly some data to suggest it's not unreasonable, but it requires a detailed conversation with the patient. A complete clinical response, what do you do? That's, you know, typically involves, certainly in my experience and practice, a detailed discussion with the patient regarding what does, um, what does kind of complete clinical response mean and what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean a cure. I always tell patients 20 to 30% of patients will have a regrowth typically within two years. Patient has to basically commit to a very intensive surveillance program, a lot of endoscopic assessment and MRI imaging. And, you know, it, and also obviously that's something these, these cases always should be reviewed within a, um, a multidisciplinary tumor board meeting in the setting and collaboration and communication. Um, MRIs is, 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 is very helpful and useful, particularly diffusion weighted imaging can help basically in terms of, so it is very much, that's the piece of like Marcus said at the beginning, I think about the collaboration and having colleagues and having a radiologist. We're very fortunate because of the fact that we have this, uh, the NAPREC, the National Accreditation Program set up with a very high functioning tumor board and that this is, this is essential for these sort of cases. Last couple of minutes, I'll just to talk about our experience. So 
uh, Marcus and I were part partners uh, before um, he 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 um, left us to go down to you guys in DC, and we saw a significant shift in our practice where um, we basically have in the last three or four years gone to a sense where sixty to seventy percent of our patients are now getting TNT um, for locally advanced cancer. So that's been a huge change. In a similar approach, we've also shifted away from minimally invasive open procedures. Nearly all our patients get a robotic approach. We found that helps reduce our risk of, of um, conversion to open procedures. And we think it, it helps part of a program to deliver qu um, quicker uh, recovery for patients. Um, and then basically, we've also seen that this um, approach of TNT and an MDT session has basically also led us to um, improve our rate of radial positivity. So such that our circumferential margin rate is on average um, running about just around 9%, which is about half the national average in the United States. So very finally, organ preservation, you have to practice what I'm preaching, which is, so this is our systemic, our local experience in our unit, University of Rochester. Marcus and I would have actually cared for a lot of these patients. So we have 41 patients who have entered a watch and wait program the last four years. Um, short follow-up, but basically our regrowth rate is within the kind of published average. Um, and obviously we need to continue to follow these patients out to make sure they're doing okay. So what are the take-home points? Total new adjuvant therapy basically uh, improves tumor response, tolerance of chemo, number of patients receiving chemos, number of dose and total dose. Um, I think ongoing studies, there's still probably, despite Oprah and the other study, there, there, there's still some question, I think, um, people regarding induction versus consolidation. We also need to just, I think, further kind of figure out what is the important cancer-specific outcomes that we should be following in these studies. And then remember this, there's there's like almost like a, a menu of options coming up now. Um, so long course chemo radiation could look at chemo radiation, a short period of waiting, systemic chemo waiting. That's at least 30 weeks uh, door to door. And that could be longer as you know with treatment delays. One of the advantages of short course radiation is potentially it might offer equivalent outcomes. If you look at Rapido and other studies and European data, in a shorter period of time. That's a big issue for a lot of our patients um, where, you know, in terms of transportation and taking time off work, et cetera. So there are lots of little nuances here to think about. And I think that we need to recognize that one size does not fit all. Some of our patients may place an awful lot of emphasis on trying to achieve a, um, organ preservation, complete chemical response. Some of our patients may play, place more of an emphasis on a, you know, a fairly efficient treatment cycle and a very clear uh, entry and exit point. Um, and it, I think that's really important in terms of our education of patients regarding so they can help make informed decisions for their treatment options. So in summary, I think we're in a really exciting time in rectal cancer care. Um, we're at a point where we have to, there's almost like a, a moment where you have to make a decision regarding your philosophy or mindset. How much emphasis do we place on organ preservation as a goal? Should it always be the objective? I don't think so, but it shouldn't just be an occasional bonus. Um, I think we need more data to identify eligible candidates. We also need to do a better job of identifying those patients who unfortunately are um, not, because tumors are not responding, so that we can not necessarily, uh, we can shift course quicker. Um, we also need to do more work in terms of endoscopic surveillance. You need to have a clear plan and do, do a better job in, in picking up these regrowths quicker. And then finally, we need to consider unintended consequences, whether this um, more complicated delivery of care in the neoadjuvant uh, setting, is that gonna help narrow or maybe exacerbate the inequalities in rectal cancer, which are already present in the United States? So in conclusion, in 100 years, we've come from maximal surgical approach with Ernest Miles and the abdominal perineal resection, which was basically everyone got a stoma, everyone had a massive operation, um, to basically a scenario now where 
people like me aren't maybe not even going to be operating on patients. And that's okay, because as long as a patient get good outcomes, that's all that matters. Thank you very much. Thank you for that was an excellent talk. And it's um, in oncology, we're always looking for, for more therapies, but in rectal cancer, we have an area where potentially uh, backing down on therapy, particularly when it comes to surgery, may be uh, what's best for the patient outcome, patient experience. Um, quick reminder for those um, in person, please scan the QR code on page nine. Um, after our next speaker, you will have an interaction interactive session with questions. So uh, page nine in your uh, brochure, please scan a QR code. Okay, so now shifting gears to the role of radiation in pancreas cancer, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sarah Hoff. Dr. Sarah Hoff is a professor of radiation oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, where she's been section head of the GI radiation oncology department for the past 15 years. She received her medicine degree at the University of Vermont, completed a radiation oncology residency at Memorial Sloan Kettering and Duke University, and a fellowship in radiation oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She has a strong clinical interest in the treatment of patients with GI cancers and has a high volume pancreas practice, pancreas cancer practice with extensive experience using MRI guided stereotactic body radiation therapy. In addition to her clinical care and research duties, she also has a strong interest in professional development, running a leadership course for Moffitt's radiation oncology residents, as well as a leadership master class at Astro. Her interest in innovation and digital health has result resulted in 27 Tele Awards for video and virtual reality patient education. And she currently directs her department's virtual reality projects. With that, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Sarah Hoff. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee and Dr. Noel for this kind invitation. And thank you, Dr. Fleming, for such a great an initial foray here. So indeed, just like Dr. Fleming said, we have many controversies in GI cancers today, and it's really exciting to start talking about pancreatic cancer. Many of you on the call are, are with me in this vein. I know we're all struggling what to do with our patients as more and more papers get released every day. So with that as an introduction, I'm gonna focus uh, okay, hang on one second. I'm advancing my slides, but it's not advancing. Um, so I may ask, oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. So I, I may ask uh, that the first question is, where have we been? You know, as Dr. Mukherjee mentioned, I trained at Sloan Kettering over 20 years ago, and I think sometimes it's helpful to think about where we've been and where we're going, especially with some of our new technologies. As she mentioned, stereotactic body radiation therapy has been very paramount in the last few years, and a lot of investigators are asking the question, how much does this really add to the paradigm of pancreatic cancer? So I wanted to talk a little bit today about some of the lessons we've learned, some of the lessons we've learned nationally when SBRT first came out some of the lessons we've learned at Moffitt Cancer Center since we've been doing SBRT since 2006, and then really focusing on the future. Now that we have better techniques and technologies, where can we go? Okay. There we go. I think there's a little delay in the slide, so forgive me. So today we want to focus really on borderline and locally advanced cancers. So many of us at our institutions, we think of NCCN imaging criteria, and we think of those borderline case cases that are anatomically adjacent to a vessel less than 180 degrees. But many of us on the call also think of borderline candidates for surgery sometimes based on the biology. There may be those indeterminate pulmonary nodules, which many of us struggle with at our tumor boards. And certainly in Florida, where I practice, we're seeing many, many, uh, many, many um, issues with the condition of the patient and the condition of the patient where sometimes they're not eligible for surgery. And then, of course, we see many patients with locally advanced disease with vessel circumference greater than 180 degrees. Next slide. Okay, so where have we been? We think about prior to gemcitabine and the era before gemcitabine, and there were many questions about what is really the role of chemoradiation. So if you go all the way back to 1980s, the questions of the day was, is chemoradiation combination therapy superior to radiation alone, and is it superior to chemo alone? And some of the early investigators felt that the combination therapy was superior, but yet you look, one-year survival, 40%, median survival, 10 months, and you see that the doses of radiation were all over the place, from 40 to 54 to 60 
Misty Gray. Next slide. So then you look at the gemcitabine era and you look at, well, what happens when investigators started using induction regimens where you give gemcitabine first before different combinations of chemo radiation? Note that mainly the investigators were using 5-FU in conjunction with radiation, but some investigators also used additional drugs, such as the Europeans who were piloting cisplatin along with 5-FU and some other investigators using gemcitabine-based combinations. And here I wanted to just focus on the fact that this really represents a split in thinking. You see the Europeans in this trial thought that the chemotherapy alone was the better arm, and that really parallels a shift in thinking from our European colleagues, where not only this study, but a number of other studies seem to tout the superiority of chemotherapy. So chemo radiation regimens were sort of left on the side and proceeding forward with chemotherapy versus U.S. investigators who continued to try to figure out, well, what is really the role of radiation for this patient population? Next slide. So one of the lessons that we've learned, and I think it's important when any of us are reading these literature studies, is to remember the impact of quality, particularly when you're talking about tumors of the upper abdomen. And I just wanted to point out two examples. The first example is RTOG 9704, which of course was the phase three post-op trial. But interesting, there was actually a survival difference based on patients who were treated per protocol versus those who were not. And similarly, there's also increased toxicity from some randomized trials that have been done showing worse toxicity in patients who were not treated according to protocol. So that's one thing over the years that we've learned is when we're dealing with tumors of the upper abdomen, the quality of the radiation, how the fields are designed, where the doses are going is really critical to ensuring that we get the best outcomes for our patients. Next slide. So the questions come up over the years, what should we treat? And if you look at the top two pictures here, that is traditionally the old fields that used to be treated, treating the gross disease plus treating the elective nodal sites. And if you notice the two uh, photos on the bottom of the slide, that is GTV only. So you're covering gross tumor volume plus margin. And this was a nice study that was done in the early 2000s by investigators from the University of Michigan, where they wanted to investigate concurrent gemcitabine, which is a potent radiosensitizer. And they knew that if they did that, they had to minimize toxicity. So what they wanted to do was determine if we just treat GTV only, are we going to have any increased failures by not covering elective sites? And indeed, they didn't find any increased local failures. And this really provided the impetus for the shift in investigators thinking. Next slide. So investigators began thinking about, well, let's limit our fields and perhaps let's dose escalate where the tumor vessel interface is. So as you can see here, the same group from the University of Michigan talked to the surgeons and thought, okay, where is our highest risk volume? Our highest risk volume may be where the tumor vessel interface is. So how can we use some of these advanced radiation strategies to increase the dose focally to that area? Next slide. So that leads us to where we're thinking mod more modern, which is how can we exploit the therapeutic window? When we have tumors that are predominantly in the head of the pancreas, sometimes within millimeters of the duodenum or within millimeters of the stomach, how can we really think about optimizing our radiation strategies to result in better outcomes while not having toxicity? Because toxicity in the upper abdomen is significant. Next slide. And with the advent of technology, it has led us to understand and appreciate why some of these quality issues matter, particularly when you're talking about abdominal tumors, really motion is important. And with the advent of the 4D CT scan, we're now able to measure motion of each pancreatic cancer. Next slide. So you can see here in the pancreas, there's significant motion in the anteroposteral, meterolateral, and craniocaudad view. And you even look at a maximum of two centimeters of craniocaudad motion. And so then that translates to a larger treatment field that uh, translates to more uncertainty in the position of the adjacent organs. And it really represents a therapeutic challenge, which investigators have struggled with over the last 15 years. Next slide. And in addition to respiratory motion, there's also gastric filling. And this is something that's underappreciated until you take 
uh, stead. And so, for example, in this slide here, this represents the position of the empty stomach versus the full stomach. And in B, you see when patients are given instructions to be NPO for three hours prior to each daily treatment, you can still see the tremendous variation in the position of the stomach. This translates to us to a very, very difficult clinical conundrum where we're trying to dose escalate to the pancreas, but not at the expense of potentially having a complication in the adjacent stomach. Next slide. So this uh, technology advance has really led us into the era where we think about biologically effective dose. And in this talk, I really wanted to set the stage for that today because I think all of us, as we read the literature and the radiation regimens are different and how radiation is delivered, it's important that you understand how we think about making that dose comparable. And so how we think about BED, you see here the standard fractionation is 1.8 to 2 gray per day. And then you see what can happen with high dose per fraction. So 6.6 .6 to 25 gray are all single fraction doses that have been used in the setting of pancreatic cancer over the last 10 years. And interestingly enough, we think there's a different radiobiologic mechanism when you use high dose per fraction. Investigators are not sure what the mechanism is. There's different theories, but there does appear to be a threshold dose by which you have more cell kill. And investigators think the threshold dose may be 8 gray. Next slide. But this is important because when we examine some of the early data with SBRT, it puts it in perspective. So if you look at the slide on the left, this is taken from Stanford, who were one of the first investigators in the U.S. using stereotactic modalities. They very bravely gave 25 gray single fraction treatment. Now step back and put that in perspective. Two gray per fraction is the standard dose. So this is essentially 20, uh, excuse me, 10 times, over 10 times the standard dose of treatment. And when you look at their feedback, fields, very, very tight fields, they had a one-year overall survival of 50%. Contrast that with investigators from Europe. And investigators from Europe, when they first came out with their SBRT, they reported their experience with a three-fraction regimen. But look at how the overall survival was only 5% at a year with a median of 5.4 months. And you can see here that there was significantly more normal tissue that was treated. And so the European investigators, we learned a lot from them sharing their experience and really all of us as a community thinking, if we're going to dose escalate, we've got to do it very conformally, very tightly, because we're so concerned about adjacent organs. Next slide. This is from Stanford from their early experience. With the majority of patients in their early experience getting single fraction, you can see the range of normal tissue complications and quite significant duodenal perforation, gastric ulceration, bleeding. So all of that really led uh, those of us in the field to shy away from single fraction regimens and think about a five fraction course to minimize the risk of a normal tissue complication. Next slide. Not only has higher BED regimens been looked at in SBRT, but also in more protracted fractionation regimens. And here I just wanted to share with you an example. This was work that was done out of MD Anderson where they took locally advanced patients who had stable disease after systemic therapy, and they looked at escalating doses of radiation with chemo radiation. And interestingly, they found that if the BED was greater than 70 gray, patients had a superior outcome. And on their series, it was the only predictor of improved overall survival and multivariate. So this was very provocative, thinking that we need to dose escalate not only in long course situations, but also in stereotactic situations. And I wanted to point out to you here in this table, 50 gray in five fractions, that has a BED of 100 gray. And that is a very significant uh, dose because you're going to be hearing more about that in the coming years. Next slide. So when we think when we think about uh, some of those trials that have been done, we also think about if the trials that have been less than 70 gray BED. And LAP07, as we all know, did not show a survival benefit. So after chemotherapy, the hope was that chemo radiation would show a survival benefit. It did not, although it did show an improvement in local progression. But I note again that the BED was less than 70 gray. Next slide. <clears throat> 
And that brings us to thinking about the present time where there's so much controversy about what constitutes the best neoadjuvant regimen. And this recent trial, the Preopank trial, is very provocative because it took patients who have resectable and borderline resectable disease and randomized them to upfront surgery versus GEM followed by GEMRT followed by GEM. And the five-year survival difference is striking that neoadjuvant therapy was significantly better than immediate surgery. But I think when you're viewing data like this, you also also have to think about the best adjuvant therapy data. And, and those of you who are familiar with Terry Conroy's, Conroy's recent update in JAMA Oncology showing adjuvant fulfirinox now with a five-year overall survival of 43% versus 31% with gemcitabine. That's striking. And so as we start thinking about patient selection criteria, we have to think about adjuvant versus neoadjuvant. And I think we're still a long way to determine what is the best neoadjuvant strategy. Next slide. So investigators from the Alliance have been pioneering possible strategies. They have been pioneering, well, what about if we give fulfirinox for four cycles and then we do long course chemo radiation with a BED of almost 60 and then go to surgery. Interestingly, this regimen showed significant um, survival if they had less than 5% residual disease. And you see in their series, they had a 13% pass CR rate and, and the median survival is not even reached if they had less than 5% residual disease, suggesting that perhaps not only is it enough to do neoadjuvant therapy, but how much cell kill we actually get with our regimen may be more important than we even know. Next slide. So I'd like to share with you briefly a little bit of our experience and what lessons we have learned. I personally have been doing five fraction SBRT since 2006. And we recently had our new faculty look at our experience to try to understand moving forward in the, in the Fulfirinox era, what lessons we've learned. Next slide. So in our experience, we treated 377 patients, the majority of which you can see there were borderline resectable and pancreatic head. Now in this series, which really represents a long period of time, we primarily were gem-based, and there was only a minority of patients in this particular series that had fulfirinox, about a third. And in addition, there was only a minority of patients who had our newer ablative techniques, which I'm going to describe because you're going to all be hearing a lot more about ablative SBRT in the future. But looking at that together, we wanted to learn um, the lessons over the last 10 years. Next slide. So what we've really learned is that there's two main strategies that we have for trying to deliver ablative dose. And in the predominant of our series, prior to some of the advanced technologies, we would dose escalate at the tumor vessel interface, which as I mentioned, was uh, done primarily at the University of Michigan in the early 2000s. And so we did not attempt to give the entire tumor the full dose. We attempted to dose escalate where the tumor vessel interface is. Now, since 2019, we've had an MRI linear accelerator at our facility, and so now our predominant mode is to treat everybody on the MRI LINAC. We've learned a lot over that time that as much as we may want to put our patients on the MRI LINAC, some patients are just not candidates. Our patient population in Florida, they can't sometimes hold their breath for that long, they can't lay still for an hour, and they may have claustrophobia. So if they're not candidates for the MRI LINAC, which you can see here with the narrow aperture, we're still treating them with fiducial markers and treating them on our main machine. Next slide. So you can see here the differences, and this is sort of an evolution of field design. This is from our earlier series where we gave very tight fields. You see two fiducial markers in the pancreas with a tight field. And now you can see with the MRI LINAC, it's a different way of treating. We have the ability not only to give very high dose to the tumor, but also we're back to thinking about maybe we should be giving some elective nodal irradiation. We can talk about that potentially in the discussion. It's beyond the scope today, but just understand nationally, there's a lot of investigators who are now reimagining what the radiation field should look like, thinking we should treat gross disease, but we should also treat a surrounding margin of tissue. Next slide. I wanted to highlight again this important thing about empty versus full stomach and really show you this is how my patient's stomach was at the time of simulation, yet an hour before treatment, this my young patient, who was 42, decided to go to the uh, cafeteria and have biscuits and gravy, and you can see the amount of stomach distension, and this was from his pretreatment MRI scan. So the importance of really understanding that if you're going to dose escalate. Next slide. So with the advent of the MRI linear accelerator, we're really able 
to focus on dose escalation. And that's because we have real-time MRI imaging that's going on throughout the acquisition and throughout the patient's treatment. Next slide. And not only that, but we actually have to have the patients be engaged with us. You can see here that the patients are wearing glasses. We ask the patients to observe the position of the tumor and the position within the target so that they can optimize their breath hold. And it's not an easy thing for patients if they have to lay still for an hour and intermittently hold their breath. But we've been impressed with our experience that even patients in their 80s with proper coaching, and we, that's why I developed a virtual reality prototype, can help and can and augment their training. Next slide. So one of the important points as you read the literature with MRI-guided treatment is the ability to adapt the radiation. And here in this example, you see where the tumor is supposed to be, and then you see on the first day of treatment or the second day of treatment, the stomach position changes. And when the position of the stomach changes, if you use the plan from before, you would have a potential GI complication. So we're able to deliver a real-time plan that day that adapts the dose to the anatomy of the day, which is a tremendous change. Next slide. So going back to our experience, a few things that we've learned over the past 15 years, when done with a lot of care and a lot of attention, the risk of grade three plus late toxicity is very low. It's less than 5%. And we realized in our experience, the majority of our patients were able to be resected. And importantly, even 15% of our locally advanced patients were able to be resected. And I think many of you on the call may be experiencing similar things at your home institution and high rates of R0 resection. Next slide. Important, next slide. Importantly, however, what we found was resection improved every, every endpoint. So our goal working closely with our surgeons is what can we do to really optimize the patient's potential chance for resection? And I think the question is, is a good one is to how far can we go with these new techniques to convert our locally advanced patients? Next slide. So one of the questions that's come up is now that we're in the process of delivering 50 gray and five fractions, 100 gray BED to these folks with the MRI linear accelerator, what does that mean for surgical outcomes? And so our surgeons were very interested in this and we worked collaboratively to look at our first 26 patients to see if there was any difference in outcomes. Next slide. And what we found was that there was no significant difference in any surgical outcomes, that patients generally tolerated the procedure very well Interestingly enough, we found that the time from radiation to surgery was associated with a improved tumor regression grade, like we've seen in multiple other GI tumor sites. I, to my knowledge, it's the first time somebody's actually shown that in pancreas, so that's very thought-provoking. And we were excited to see 100% uh, one-year overall survival in this 26-patient uh, cohort. Next slide. But importantly, it's still sobering. When you look at your TRG outcomes with TRG2 being partial response and TRG3 being poor response, it's still sobering that the majority of patients had either a partial or poor response, despite giving such high radiation doses. So clearly, we have a long way to go to try to optimize this for our patients. Next slide. So now, of course, many of you on the call, and I think it may come up in the discussion, is uh, the whole controversy surrounding the five-fraction alliance trial. And we've got to give credit to the alliance investigators. This was a very well-intentioned trial, taking borderline resectable patients and randomizing between fulfirinox only uh, prior to surgery versus fulfirinox, followed by radiation and five fractions, followed by surgery. Note the BED was 54 in the study. Now, importantly, as many of you know, the primary endpoint was 18-month overall survival, but they had a planned interim assessment with a planned arm closure if uh, patients did not undergo R0 resection. And the radiation arm, unfortunately, uh, that was the story, and so that arm was closed. Next slide. But many of you know, I, I think it's very Im informative that the modified fulfirinox arm had a median, uh, median survival of 29.8 months. The radiation arm was inferior, and as we mentioned, the, the trial was closed early from, for the radiation arm. But I think it's important when you compare this data, and that's why I'm, I'm going through it today, it's important when you compare the data that five-fraction SBRT is different in an ablative state versus what the investigators were able to deliver on this trial. Next slide. So finally, um, as we wind up here before we go into the question and answer, 
and the discussion, let's talk a little bit about some late breaking abstracts. So this late breaking abstract was just presented about a month ago in Astro. It's very exciting. And I think you're gonna see a lot more data about this. This was MRI guided ablative SBRT 50 and five after a minimum of three months of chemo. The majority of patients had locally advanced disease although there, though there were some borderlines. Next, next slide. And interestingly enough, you can look at the median survival of the entire cohort. You can look at in this national study only a 9% risk of grade three or higher toxicity. But note here, 93% of the fractions were adaptive, showing the power that if you have that technology, it's important to adapt the dose. Next slide. So let's finish up in a few slides here thinking about future directions, because as we understand these controversies, we all want to know what can we really do to improve our outcomes, increase path CR, convert more locally advanced patients to surgery, and really figure out who benefits from radiation therapy and try to optimize patient selection. Next slide. So just to point out a few things coming down the pike, there may be benefit to a new class of agents. These agents are superoxide dismutase mimetics. We know when radiation goes in, it induces dose-dependent bursts of superoxide, which is harmless to a normal cell, but toxic to a cancer cell. And so now there's some new trials going on using these class of pharmaceuticals to think, is this actually going to have benefit as not only a radiation sensitizer, but also a tumor potentiator? Next slide. And so far, the evidence looks promising. The first trial, which we participated in, of 42 patients met all the endpoints, as you see here. Currently, many of you may have this trial open at your institution. The multi-center Greco-2, which is an international trial, is open. It's taking borderline or locally advanced patients who've had at least six weeks of chemotherapy. And then the randomization is SBRT plus the drug or SBRT plus placebo. So hopefully, we'll have some really good evidence in a few years of the benefit of not only giving high doses, but with this potential new class of agent. Next, next slide. And also, as we mentioned um, with the earlier data that did not show a benefit with radiation, the question now is, will there be a benefit with high BED SBRT? So just to put this on everyone's radar, this is the LAP ablate trial, which is going to be done with induction and SBRT versus chemo alone. The endpoint is going to be two-year overall survival, and there's, there'll be a lot of interest generated since this trial will only be done using high doses with MRI-guided adaptive therapy, which is currently the best that we have of today. Next slide. So in conclusion, I wanted to show you today that the jury is still out on dose escalated SBRT. A lot of the studies that have been done with lower radiation regimens have failed to show a benefit, but the door is still open with some of these higher doses. MRI guided technique with adaptive planning may hold a lot of future interest for us. The prospective SMART trial shows the safety of a high BED approach. And I think the, the open area really is locally advanced disease. Can we convert more patients? And will there be a new class of protectors such as the superoxide dismutase mimetic? And with that, I want to keep us on schedule and get back to the questions. So Dr. Mukherjee and Dr. Noel, thank you so much and take it away. Thank you, Sarah. That was awesome. And you didn't disappoint. Radiation oncologists definitely have the coolest toys. <laughs> And all of the expensive, right? <laughs> Nine yes. million for the MRI Linux. <laughs> Not cheap. Um, so we're going to try to go into the questions now. I believe uh, the audience online should be able to have access to the questions. And then in the room here, I think we're going to display the questions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the Q&A would, it's going to, we, we can um, maybe hold the Q&A until the end. So uh, let's go to the first rectal cancer question. Um, so I will just quickly give the highlights, 65 years, and there's, there's no right answer. There's probably maybe one or two that we would all select, but um, 65 year old male with history of hypertension, diabetes presented with right red blood core rectum, malconstipation. Uh, colonoscopy reveals a rectal, eight centimeter rectal mass. Uh, it's uh, pelvic, the MRI reveals a five centimeter mass extending through the muscular propria. Uh, there, it's a T3 N0 tumor. Uh, 
margin, circumferential margins are not involved. Uh, ECOG one, patient is deemed a surgical candidate and, and patient's goals are treatment, most likely to prolong survival. And here are the options, long course, Long, long course chemo radiation followed by TMA, uh, followed by chemo, short course surgery, chemo, TNT surgery, TNT. Uh, t the totally other therapies uh, have one chemo radiation first and one chemotherapy first, uh, and then watch and wait. And so we have that must not right. Correct. Uh, that looks better. Okay. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I like I like this I like this answer. Um, so, Doctor Fleming, are you on Are you on the call? I am, sir. You want to comment on the approach for a patient like this? Sure. Um, so I, I like the way the question took, alluded to the patient's preferences. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I think given the scenario you described, I would probably, yes, I think that's probably, I would go with the 29%. Um, I'm curious, you know, prolonged survival, I mean, the limited data we have does not suggest that if a patient needs complete clinical response, we don't really have data to suggest it's going to negatively impact on their survival, not to offer them a TME. Um, so I would be, I, that, that would be part of my conversation with the patient. If the patient, say a patient met criteria for complete clinical response, um, you know, I probably would say to the patient that to be definitive doing the rectal resection, um, you know, would give them clarity regarding things and take away uncertainty. But um, I don't think a patient stressing survival would necessarily stop me from at least having the conversation about watching weight if they met the criteria. And you alluded to this in your talk, but when patients come in, and they are weighing options and they probably ask you, you know, what, you know, if I go through chemo radiation and chemo, what's the chance that I'm gonna be able to avoid surgery? What, what do you quote patients? So, so what I typically- Go ahead, sorry. Well, I, so I'll typically quote a lower figure than maybe they've heard, that they, they perceive that they've heard maybe from medical radiation oncology. I think a lot of patients are overwhelmed in that setting with information and they don't always, they don't always hear what we think they're hearing from us. Um, so I would typically say to a patient, um, long course chemo radiation, traditional, where if I do an assessment of say eight weeks, um, about 15% of patients, maybe a little bit more, might meet the criteria. I think, you know, with the new TNT regimens, um, it's probably much higher. It's probably going to be in the region of maybe 30 to 40%. But I always flip the question the other way, Marcus, and I say to them, but that means one and two don't meet criteria because um, one of the things I do find in practice is that it, for patients who really, really set their sights on meeting complete clinical response and no surgery, it's psychologically really hard for them. It almost feels like a defeat that they're having surgery. And that's why I think language use is really important here. The surgery is not a failure if we end up doing surgery. It's just part of their tr treatment process. Um, so yeah, for TNT, I might say 30 to 40%, but I stress to patients that that's that is a desirable goal for us, but our main goal is to get them effective treatment to try to um, manage their tumor, reduce their risk of recurrence. Thanks, Virgo. Um, so Rita is going to do the next question. Okay, so if we can proceed. 
So the next case is a 67 year old female history of smoking hypothyroidism. She's coming in with a lot of symptoms of abdominal pain, severe constipation. She has a colonoscopy that shows a near obstructing mass around nine centimeters from the anal verge. It's microsatellite stable adenocarcinoma. Her staging MRI shows a five centimeter mass. It's extending through the muscularis propria beyond the mesorectal fascia, so T4. And she has four enlarged lymph nodes, making her an N2 lesion. She does have some high risk pathologic features with extramural vascular invasion and circumferential resection margin involvement and threatened. She has good, decent performance status, no metastatic disease. She is deemed a surgical candidate and similar to the last patient, she just really wants what is most likely gonna prolong her survival. So how would we treat this patient with um, a mid rectal cancer, slightly higher path, uh, clinical staging, and some high risk um, pathologic uh, MRI features. And presenting quite symptomatic near obstructing. <laughs> we can. <laughs> So the answer choices most, most chosen are also the, the TNT approaches. Um, and Dr. Fleming, if you could comment here as well. I think, I think a lot of the comments you made on the last case are probably pertinent here too in terms of the wait and watch approach. But I think this question just kind of shows that we still aren't 100% sure of what sequencing, what chemotherapy backbones, and even what radiation arms to use. We have one option such as um, the, the short course radiation followed by consolidation chemo based on the Rapido trial, and then fulfirinox induction by, followed by consolidation radiation based on the Prodige. Um, so both options not really been compared head to head, but Dr. Fleming, would you like to comment on this case and the answer? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm a little surprised at the response. Uh, I'm surprised so many people went for short course. Um, I would probably say, you know, the other question, another option here for, for discussion would be if the patient was having very significant symptoms and an impassable mass, whether there's a role for defunctioning the patient before treatment. The downside of defunctioning, obviously, is it delays patient going to treatment. Um, I, I, the other sidebar, just because it's something I'm very passionate about, is I, I would hope to um, leverage the patient's uh, desire to live long to get her to uh, engage with our smoking cessation program, get her stopping straight away. Treatment-wise, I probably personally, um, in our setting, I think we probably would still go with uh, chemo first before radiation. Um, um, but uh, I think that I think there's sometimes a, a concern raised that if we go radiation first, if you get a lot of edema, the patient get obstructed. Um, that's kind of why, you know, often if there's, when we do an assessment, the kind of things we're looking at are, is there, you know, is there any sort of lumen there or not? Or is this basically a completely obstructed tumor? Because those patients do run into difficulty during treatment and treatment interruption obviously needs to be minimized. But I probably personally would favor giving this patient systemic chemo for a couple of cycles and then considering radiation. Um, but I said, I'm a little surprised people were op op opting for short course. It's uh, interesting. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's what it's, I suppose it kind of depends on where you see that short course going. I mean, you do see it being short course and weight. Um, I assume that's what people mean. Um, whether in these locally advanced tumors, you're going to see the same degree of tumor downsizing for these kind of ugly tumors as long course. I think we're not quite sure on the answer to that one. 
And can I just interject too? I totally agree with Dr. Fleming. And as the radiation oncologist, I would be very concerned about giving short course first in the case that you described, because you do the case that you described the patient as having abdominal pain and constipation. And certainly we would be concerned about the higher dose per fraction. And just as Dr. Fleming said, causing edema. So that's a real concern in a patient such as this. If the patient didn't have those symptoms, perhaps it's a different story. But yeah, I would have concern as well. Great. Yeah, I think this is a good case to kind of just show while we have all these slew of different options and sequencing, um, you know, the, the clinical scenario in which the patient arises can maybe help us determine um, what type of induction therapy to do. And so in this very symptomatic patient, it might make sense to do a systemic therapy first. Um, we can move on to the case number three. So case number three is a 50-year-old male who presents with a three-centimeter rectal adenocarcinoma. It's microsatellite stable, located three centimeters from the anal verge on colonoscopy, so a low-lying tumor. Um, and this was diagnosed in the setting of iron deficiency anemia on labs. His uh, staging MRI showed a three-centimeter mass extending through the muscularis propria into the mesorectum, T3 lesion. Um, no suspicious lymph nodes, no extramural vascular invasion and the circumferential resection margin is not threatening. He also has decent performance stati uh, status, but the surgical recommendation is to do an abdominal perineal resection, an APR, um, leaving him with an ostomy. Uh, the patient expresses that he's strong, he would like to avoid an ostomy if possible. He's 50 years old, young guy, but he'll do it if it's his op only option for long-term survival. So how would we treat this low-lying T3 N0 tumor in this young patient who'd ideally like to avoid an ostomy, um, but, but does want a cure? Okay, so it seems most people would prefer either long course chemo radiation or, or some induction radiation followed by consolidation chemotherapy and a wait and watch approach um, versus um, uh, seems shorter long course radiation before a local excision. Um, so the long course chemo radiation um, or short course before the consolidation chemo is one of the arms from the OPRA trial that Dr. Fleming went over. And the, the, the approach for radiation or chemo radiation before local excision was in reference to the GRECAR2 trial that Dr. Fleming went over as well. So Dr. Fleming and Dr. Hawk, would you like to comment on the um, audience selection of these answers and maybe what would make you choose one over the other or any clinical considerations that would make you favor one choice over the other? If I can start, because I want to ask Dr. Fleming a question. So for me, my answer would be long course chemo radiation, followed by chemo, followed by the potential watch and wait if the patient's got a complete clinical response. I'm curious, since you put short course radiation here, and certainly the short term data shows that there tends to be good function. But for me personally, I guess I want to see some longer term data if we're thinking about watch and wait with higher dose per fraction. So Dr. Fleming, how, how would you approach this if someone wanted to do short course radiation in your practice. Do you see differences in function when we're trying to do watch and wait? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I don't think the data is there to answer that question about, you know, that's a, I think, you know, it, it, it's a really good question. I mean, what the question, you know, there are many paths that can lead to a patient meeting criteria for watch and wait, but I don't think we know whether the, the different kind of paths will have different outcomes in terms of patient symptoms. So for most patients, um, if a patient basically, just in broad terms, uh, if a patient gets, um, one of the reasons why I was a little, uh, you know, circumspect with the Jack Grecar 2 study is that um, if a patient receives chemo radiation and then has any form of local excision, it's definitely going to be different. Frequency and urgency is the biggest issues when if I take a little bit of someone's rectum out, even the local excision. 
Um, I don't think the data is there regarding whether short course versus long course in patients and watch and wait and symptom profile. I think it's a great question. I don't think that's being answered. I think that the um, I think that you know there has been understandably a uh, concern. Um, particularly in the United States about the use of short course because of looking at the European data. I think that um, I think that if you look at the medium to long term Dutch data, where there, more, there was more standardizing the short term the sh as, as short course radiation, I think the functional outcomes um, don't look great, but I would always say, well, compared to a T&E, they're a lot better. Um, the reality of the situation is um, the surgery that I do and my colleagues do, it might be necessary for many patients, but there's certainly a functional cost with it. Um, having said all that, I'm still, while I'm an advocate for short course in certain circumstances, in ergothere tumors, I still have a preference for patients getting long course. Um, that's, I think that um, I still need to see more data for, for what I call ugly tumors, giving short course alone. And I know the Rapido data would show some of it. There's also some surgical concerns around Rapido in terms of the TME planes, et cetera, and the question mark whether short course and a longer interval to surgery, is that associated with more fibrosis? Does that tend to cause more surgical issues in terms of our TME plane? So I personally, would, I would be, I would, advocate the same treatment path you have. Okay, and I just wanted to kind of, uh, one thing is that the other answer that the majority of the audience chose or the second one, um, I think that is actually being evaluated in the GRECR 12 study. It's kind of an extension off of the GRECR 2, where here they're adding fulfirinox um, to a TNT type approach with local excision. So that will be interesting to see. Um, we're going to skip the next question because we'd like to move on to the pancreas cancer, uh, cancer cases. So if we could just move to that. Yep. Thank you. All right. So the first, first case, 66-year-old female presenting with jaundice, pale stools, fatigue, found to have a poor centimeter pancreatic head mask, satisfied the RCP employee stent placement. And there's biopsy-proven adenocarcinoma. After biliary compression, you can see the uh, CN19-9 and the CT scan findings uh, notable for uh, essentially resectable disease. Uh, the uh, symptoms, she's ECOG-1 with a little bit of weight loss, evaluated by a surgery who feels the lesion is resectable. And so how would you treat this patient if you're looking for an R0 resection, but also uh, uh, consistent with the current data and in your institutional practice. Uh, we have upfront surgery options and we have new adjuvant chemotherapy options. Billy. What's the Billy? What'd you say, Dr. Weinberg? Is okay. uh, the Billy is okay. So from Medoc standpoint, you could fire away with chemo if you'd like. Nice, I like this one. So uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, so this is certainly an area of ongoing debate in the pancreatic world um, for years. And you could argue still today, the standard of care is upfront surgery um, followed by um, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, the survival is certainly improved with fulfirinox, but not as high as we'd like it. And due to concern from micrometastatic disease, um, there's been a shift towards treatment with chemotherapy up front. There's actually an ongoing uh, clinical trial to the Alliance Cooperative Group now looking to address this question. Um, Dr. Hoff, how, how would a patient be treated like this down in Moffitt? Uh, yeah, guys... thanks, Dr. Noel. Boy, you pick great cases that really get all of us uh, thinking about all these controversial issues. So at our center, we are still in favor of upfront surgery. So if for a patient like this, we probably would agree with those audience members who would go with upfront surgery. And I know, and I know that's partly presuming the patient would get adjuvant fulfirinox. And I think all of us at our center have been so impressed with the five-year data, you know, five-year survival of 43% is really compelling. So if the patient, which sounds like in your 
particular case would get adjuvant fulfurinox, our group would probably pick that one. But I can certainly see how if you had someone that you weren't sure would be a candidate for adjuvant fulfurinox, how you might consider one of the others. Very controversial. I guess it'll depend case by case. What would you do, Dr. Noel, at your institution? Um, so it's certainly depending on, you know, I think the surgeon, um, the surgical opinion weighs heavily. Uh, my bias is is towards new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, um, but but it can de definitely go both ways. Yeah, that that's a very evolving area. Exciting, very evolving. Uh, so we'll go to the next question. So, seventy year old male with no significant comorbidities, diagnosed with uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. The CN eighty nine is one thousand. It's a five centimeter tumor. Um, the there is 10 pound weight loss over the last six months with abdominal pain ECOG2. Surgeon believes the tumor is resectable. Would you send the patient for a diagnostic laparoscopy? Yes or no? Um, for those, this is an approach where we sometimes uh, have a surgeon go in to, to look for metastatic disease because if it's found, then the surgery would not be recommended for a patient like this. So a slight uh, favorite of, of yes. Uh, Virgo, I know you're not a pancreas surgeon, but do you want to comment on diagnostic laparoscopy or do you want to pass on that? No, I mean, I, I sit on the tumor ward and I hear my <laughs> colleagues talk about this. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's it's uh, one of those areas where, um, you you know, it's not unreasonable to do. Uh, the piece I'm always curious about, though, is the timeline, you know, like basically logistics. Okay, how long is it going to take to get done? Recognizing, and I'll say it as I'm the surgeon on the podium, Surgeons always think everything's resectable, and surgeons all, well, not always, but always say this, you know, I can do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Complications can happen, just like when you do biopsies. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's like, the, it's a diagnostic laparoscopy here is reasonable as long as it's done in a timely fashion. It's got a very clear goal. Um, and then the question, and, and plus or minus, are you going to use the same opportunity to put the port in if you're thinking chemo? I, what I'm getting at is just that clear, crisp coordination of care. So there's a very clear plan. So diagnostic laparoscopy, it's, it's either, if it's positive, then, you know, unfortunately you're talking, I assume more palliative care, et cetera, but I'm just gonna, I'm stressing the need for coordination that there's a clear plan. Yeah, so Thank you. I'm just uh, looking at the clock here. How are we on time, Dr. Moore? Okay, let's do one more question. Well, this is actually just a continuation of the last case. So we talked about the diagnostic lab, and then now how would we treat this patient with this potentially, it looks like a resectable cancer, but after decompression, earlier decompression. Oh, yeah. Borderline resectable, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> So this, this uh, answer choice actually is in reference to the case we just talked about, which was still a resectable case after biliary decompression, CA-199 is 1,000, patient had significant weight loss. I like this answer. Dr. Hoff, would you like to comment on this one? Um, sure. So I agree with the audience that in this borderline case would not go to surgery first and would give some sort of neoadjuvant therapy um, based on the choices that are here, agree. And that's certainly been borne out with data from the Alliance that giving, as long as the patient's a candidate for, for, for Fulfirinox, giving Fulfirinox prior to surgery, that's a perfectly legitimate choice. At our center, what we would probably do is actually give the Fulfirinox. We have CT imaging with labs every two months. 
we have weekly tumor boards and we're always looking at response. And if the surgeon after adequate Fulfirinox is still concerned about getting an R0, then we would add radiation per our pathway. But certainly if they have a good response, as has been shown on Alliance, completely fine to go to surgery, agree. Great. Okay, I think that we'll we'll stop the questions there. And Dr. Marshall, do we have four minutes for audience questions? Or okay, I have a question, but I'd like to see first if the audience, if anyone has a question for our invited speakers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm the oldest person in the room, I think, and um, I remember that the reason we started giving radiation and rectal cancer was to make up for inadequate surgery. Now that we've been better with the PME techniques, um, apart from times when you're trying to avoid surgery, could you talk a little bit about the ongoing need for radiation? The prospect clinical trial has an arm that does not have radiation in it, and we're eager to see that. But radiation itself has uh, morbidities as well. Um, and so if one is doing a proper TME, does one need radiation? Can, can I take the first stab at that and then we'll go to Dr. Fleming? I think you're, um, whoever asked the question, you're right on point. Particularly, we see so many young patients nowadays, at least in our practice. And so, yeah, we often will start with systemic chemotherapy and see if we can avoid radiation, particularly in those young patients. I'm sure, Dr. Fleming, it's much the same in your practice. Yeah, correct. I mean, so a couple of things. So first of all, um, your you know adjuvant radiation has been demonstrated comprehensively not to uh, obviate a bad operation, um, and that's the same with chemo as well. So absolutely, um, good quality surgery TME is you know is essential. I think what I was going back to is it, we are at that interesting flex point of you know practitioners and units um, deciding philosophically what direction they're going in. Are we pursuing, um, you know, are we pursuing greater tumor uh, downsizing, downstaging with a view to increasing our rates of organ preservation? Or are we selectively deploying chemo radiation um, in situations like this? Uh, and, and, and that, and there's very interesting, you know, different approaches across the world um and that's you know again goes back to the you know my picture one size doesn't fit all there's lots there's lots of different ways of approaching this um the you know when i as of course as a surgeon um i i'm kind of like i'm not actually ironically if someone who always advocates surgery because the reality is it comes with a functional cost um for patients so um it, there may be certain scenarios where patients may choose for various reasons if they have a very, you know, clear circumferential margin, no major risk factors. It's not unreasonable in many parts of the world they'll go straight to surgery, um, and that's not unreasonable. As but you know, it does come with the issue of the functional impact of um, of the TME surgery on them, um, but uh, I think the the chemotherapy only in the prospect study. I think that's that's going to be very interesting to see what the long-term data looks like that from that. Um, and I think there will be, that's, there's this kind of interesting thing where certain patients were going to leave out very, you know, different patients were leaving out different parts of the treatment. Some patients, maybe no surgery, maybe some patients systemic chemo only. Like look at the Trek study, very interesting study. They only give short, short, you know, they got short, um, keep radiate radiation, short of course, no chemo. So I think it's a, it's an interesting kind of way, and it's 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 challenging us to think about how we want to treat this this disease. I think we're right at three thirty five, but we can can we take one more question? Yeah, I just had a personal question here in terms of the radiation. My father, who is actually the reason that I'm here because he was treated so well by Dr. Marshall had a uh, post-ripple occurrence and was treated with high-dose radiation. And afterwards, he got terrible intractable depression. I'm wondering whether you've seen that occur, because I've actually heard anecdotal stories about the depression being associated with traumatic cancer, with 
be different than just a typical depression. Dr. Mukherjee, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear the whole thing. Sure. Um, the question is based on some an, on an anecdotal experience about um, a, a patient that underwent radiation adjuvantly and then experienced some significant depression. And the question is, um, is, is this something we see? Is there, a cor and is there a correlation between some of these treatments or even just the underlying diagnosis of pancreas cancer and some of these um, psychological issues and depression that may follow? Especially with radiation. Especially with radiation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to hear about your family member. Um, no, uh, in our practice, I, I must say, I'm, I'm not really familiar with what you're describing, but I will say that the indications for post Whipple radiation have certainly got smaller and smaller over the years. Um, you know, it's, it's now our main indication is if somebody has positive lymph nodes or the surgeon's concerned about the margin, then we'll offer them long course chemo radiation. We also sometimes will offer them treatment if they have a focal isolated local recurrence and they had just had chemotherapy therapy after their Whipple. And so we will often do that. But no, what you're describing is profound. And I personally haven't seen that in my 20 years. Um, we would have to probably see if other centers have noticed that. I, I have not myself. Thank you so much for the questions, the audience participation in the polls. And thank you very much to our two speakers, Dr. Hoff and Dr. Fleming. I'm going to hand this back to Dr. Marshall now. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, speakers. Well done. You're done. You made it. Um, so this will conclude our Friday part. Um, it does start up again tomorrow morning at 8. And then we go at 8.50, uh, I think it is, for neuroendocrine. Then our patient portion uh, begins at uh, around, I think it's, I'm looking at the wrong page. But anyway, around 10, 10.45. So we welcome everyone back for that. I think some of the takeaways obviously are uh, molecular and precision medicine is critical um, to the world as GI cancers evolve. I will be interested, almost none of the talks we just heard in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting had any molecular data. So when will we begin to sort patients in the outliers based on some of their own molecular character, tumor molecular characteristics? And I think one of the other themes of today has been these really impressive novel technologies. How are we going, if they're successful, how are we going to give them to everyone? Um, are they only going to be available in certain centers that have the technologies? Will the cost be prohibitive of distributing them? We already saw examples of different parts of the world having different access uh, to what we consider standard of care uh, options. So I think as we develop new ideas and new concepts, we're also gonna to have to remember, how are we gonna share those with everybody around as we're all in this together? So with that, it's pretty close to happy hour, but most of us have some emails we need to clean up before then. But thanks everybody in the room who stuck it out and joined us today and to everybody online and in particular shout out to all the gang, the, the tech team that just does such a fabulous job uh, and to the Roosh gang and the Onclive gang for helping everybody. So have a good evening, everybody.